Welcome to this special edition of In the Lighthouse, your safe harbor from the storm. With your host, the Lighthouse Keeper, Daphne Collins bringing you Heroes of the Old Testament. Hello, and welcome to this special edition of In the Lighthouse, your safe harbor from the storm. This is Daphne Collins, your lighthouse keeper, welcoming you back as I present another installment of our series, Heroes of the Old Testament. And today we're going to begin with part one of a two-part series which is entitled, A Tale of Two Queens. And the first featured queen in our story is Jezebel. Before we begin our story of this famous queen, it is important to give you historical context of what happens in Israel and why this woman and her name became synonymous over time with everything wicked. Approximately 640 years before the period of our story, that great deliverer of the Hebrews out of bondage in Egypt, Moses, stood in the presence of the Almighty God on the craggy peaks of Mount Sinai while the people waited a total of 40 days for his return. It was during this sojourn in the wilderness that God gave Moses the law for him to teach the people. God's intent was for them to learn it live it, and teach it to their children throughout the generations. Moreover, they were to present themselves to others as a people set apart and unique amongst the pagan nations surrounding the land that the Lord was giving them. When the voice of God spoke the words of the law to Moses, it sounded like rolling thunder from the top of the mountain causing the ground to tremble beneath the people's feet. When God was present, billows of smoke and clouds enveloped the top of Sinai. Moses listened closely to the resounding voice of God as he issued the Decalogue and with his own hand carved the law upon two stone tablets cut from the granite wall of the mountain. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Moses took the law to the people to begin teaching them how they should live when they cross over into the land of Canaan. Throughout their wilderness wanderings, God continued instructing Moses on what he must teach the people concerning the abominable practices of the pagan nations across the great river Jordan. He said to Moses, You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces and I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. All through their 40 years of desert wanderings, Moses reiterated the command of God to the people to ensure that they would never forget what the Lord their God did for them 
and warned them not to follow after the abominable practices of the pagan nations they were sent to conquer and destroy. And then Moses said to the people, And when the Lord your God gives them over to you, and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them, and show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars, and dash in pieces their pillars, and chop down their ashram, and burn their carved images with fire. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God, for these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Moses also instructed his second-in-command, Joshua, who obeyed all that God commanded of Moses. Then God spoke directly to Joshua and commanded that they were to take the land of Canaan and drive out all its inhabitants. As leader, Joshua was instructed by God to issue allotments of the land of Canaan to the twelve tribes and they, in turn, were to drive out the inhabitants and take the land, from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the wilderness to the Euphrates, in the name of Yahweh. The book of Judges, however, details that the Israelites did not drive out the inhabitants of the land of Canaan, and they forgot all that was taught them from their forty years in the wilderness. Furthermore, they failed to teach the words of Moses to their children and began to practice the same idolatry of the surrounding nations and worshipped their gods. An interesting cycle of sin and repentance became a pattern during the time of the judges. The people would sin, God's anger would be stirred, and a foreign enemy would oppress the people. The people would cry out to God, and he, in turn, would raise up a judge to deliver the people from their enemy. The people would thank God, forget his deliverance, and start their pattern of sin all over again. Nearly 400 years would pass between the time of the judges and the installment of the first king over Israel. Yet disobedience to all that God instructed his king not to do became a central theme and one that would impact the generations to follow. King Saul of the tribe of Benjamin was the people's choice. King David, a man after God's own heart, was God's choice. King Solomon, David's son and God's anointed servant, sought wisdom and was given that in abundance even more than he'd ever asked of God. As God's king over Israel, Solomon was given specific instructions to follow, as did his father David. 
one absolute command was that he was not to enter into marriage with foreign women, for they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon, a lover of all women with a prodigious libido, did not obey the command of the Lord and had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Consequently, as God predicted, these women turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. As it was during the time of the judges, so too did God's anger burn against the king's disobedience, and he pronounced judgment against Solomon's shining kingdom through his prophet Ahijah the Shilonite. God judged that following Solomon's death, the kingdom would be divided in two. In the north, ten tribes would be given to Jeroboam, an Ephraimite who would be their king, whereas the tribe of Judah would remain as the southern kingdom with Jerusalem as its capital in accordance with the covenant God made with David. Following the death of Solomon, the kingdom did indeed divide in two, with Israel in the north and its capital, Tirzah, which later became Samaria. Judah was the southern kingdom and its capital, Jerusalem. The sin of idolatry continued in the divided kingdoms, primarily with Israel in the north, because of the weakness of the kings and their willingness to enter into political alliances with the pagan nations around them. God strictly forbade these kings to align with these wicked nations, otherwise they would fall under his judgment against them and their generations. We will now look to the kingdom of Israel in the north and its monarch, King Ahab, the son of the great King Amri, founder of the short-lived Amri dynasty, whose rule boasted military conquest and expansion. He resided in the capital of Tirzah and then built his palace on a hill in Samaria, which became the new capital location. Samaria and the Valley of Jezreel are the two primary locations where much of our story takes place. As it is with all rulers, a future king requires a queen, and in this telling, her name is Jezebel, Princess of Sidon. Okay, let's get started. A princess is the daughter of a monarch, the ruler of a kingdom. Following her birth, she is cosseted and left in the care of handmaidens who will care for her, dress her, and respond to her every whim. She brings value to her family in the form of strategic marriage alliances, and if she is beautiful, she would prove even more valuable through her father's negotiations for the kingdom and the fortunes of her family. It has commonly been an ancient practice of the monarch or king to agree to an advantageous alliance with a neighboring kingdom for expanding territory or providing protection in times of war. Phoenician king Ephbaal, the ruler of the sister cities of Sidon and Tyre, entered into an alliance with the newly crowned king of Israel, Ahab, and to seal their agreement, offered his daughter Jezebel in marriage to be Ahab's new queen. As the daughter of a king to the storm fertility god Baal and the fertility goddess Ashtoreth, Jezebel encouraged the priests of Baal and Ashtoreth to join her in the kingdom of Israel. To honor his new queen's arrival, Ahab had an altar erected to the storm god Baal at Mount Carmel in the valley of Jezreel and planted an Asherah pole for the goddess. Then King Ahab joined his wife, Queen Jezebel, 
in Baal worship and encouraged the people of the Northern Kingdom to bow down to Baal, the pagan god in all of Israel. Ahab, in disobedience of God's directive to kings and the people who follow him, that they were not to bow down to false gods, allowed idolatry in the kingdom. Furthermore, they were also instructed not to intermarry with the pagan nations because their wives would bring their false gods with them. Indeed, Jezebel, the new queen, did as God warned through Moses and then Joshua. The consequence of Ahab's disobedience soon followed. An emissary of the Lord, Elijah the Tishbite, arrived to pronounce God's judgment of drought over Israel in response to Ahab's and Jezebel's unholy worship of Baal. The city of Sidon, the place of Jezebel's birth, was known for its opulence and wickedness. Once the land was divided amongst the tribes by Joshua, according to God's directives, the leaders were instructed to subdue the people already living in the land. The territory allotted to the tribe of Asher included Sidon, Jezebel's home. The tribe did not crush Sidon nor destroy the altars of Baal and Asherah. The people were spared, as was the worship of their false god. They did not abolish the Canaanite as they were instructed. Queen Jezebel began a campaign to abolish all Yahweh worship in the kingdom of Israel, and she started by having the prophets killed. She wanted to eliminate any competition with her prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth. However, before Jezebel could successfully assassinate the prophets, a court official named Obadiah, who was a fervent Yahweh believer, managed to rescue 100 of the remaining prophets and secure them away from Samaria and Queen Jezebel's wicked massacre of these innocent men and their families. Faithful Obadiah hid them away in caves outside the city center. Once he was assured of their safety, Obadiah went forth to seek the prophet Elijah, who was far from the city center and not amongst those hiding from Jezebel. Obadiah met with Elijah and told him what happened and that it was Queen Jezebel who issued the command in the king's name to kill all the prophets of Yahweh. Elijah sent Obadiah to Ahab to request a meeting with him in person on Mount Carmel. Obadiah carried the message to Ahab from Elijah with the intent of excluding Jezebel from this meeting. Ahab agreed skeptically and went with Obadiah to meet with Elijah as requested on Mount Carmel, near the place where the altar to the pagan god Baal was erected. The three-year-long drought was coming to an end and God was preparing to show his hand. Upon seeing the king, Elijah swallowed back his fear and approached the man, knowing that this weak, mercurial king granted his wife a free hand at murdering hundreds of prophets of Yahweh. When Ahab spotted Elijah, he said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Then, noticing that Ahab did not come alone, Elijah turned to the onlookers who followed the king's entourage to Mount Carmel. He said to the people, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. 
When the people did not respond to Elijah's admonition, he continued, I am the only prophet of the Lord left, and here are 450 men of Baal standing before you, he said, gesturing to all the men standing before the king's chariot. Emboldened, the prophets of Baal sneered at Elijah. Where's his God now? Has he abandoned his last prophet? They mocked loudly. Ahab looked on silently, watching Elijah standing before his prophets of Baal. Then he heard Elijah issue them a challenge. Prophets of Baal, do you dare a challenge before your king? Here we have two bulls for sacrifice, one for you and the other one for me. You will cut your bull in pieces and lay it on top of the firewood over there, pointing to the altar to Baal. Only don't like the wood. Then I will prepare my bull in the same fashion and lay it on the wood at this altar over here that I have erected to Yahweh, and I will put no fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I in turn will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who responds by fire, he is God. Does that sound fair to you? The prophets and the eyewitnesses observing agreed to Elijah's proposal. Okay, you go first. I'll wait since there's more of you and just one of me, he reasoned, once again glancing at the king. The prophets of Baal took their bull and prepared it for offering and placed it on the wood, and then they called on the name of their god. O oh, Baal, answer us! They waited, but there was no response. Several hours passed, but there was still no response to their many cries. Elijah, observing from the side, mocked the prophet, saying, Cry louder, because he is a god. Either he is musing or relieving himself on a journey or perhaps asleep and needs to be awakened. The prophets ignored him and called out louder to their god and for greater effect began cutting their arms to allow blood offerings from their open wounds, which was their custom. Half the day passed, however, and still there was no response from the pagan god. Finally, it was Elijah's turn. He beckoned the people closer as he prepared the altar of the Lord, while Ahab watched suspiciously, clearly vexed that nothing happened at the altar of Baal, the prophets still wailing for the storm god to answer them. Ahab mused about how much this would displease his queen. There would be no excuse to offer following this display of incompetence. As the people looked on, Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of Israel, and with these stones placed them at the altar erected in the name of the Lord. Around the altar he dug a trench to carry two sayas of seed. The bull that he prepared for the offering was laid on the wood atop the altar. Then Elijah requested that four jars of water be poured over the dry wood. When it was done, he asked for four more jars of water and for them to do the same thing. And then a third time he requested the same four jars of water be poured over the altar, which thoroughly drenched the bull carcass and the wood as the water ran down into the trench surrounding the altar. After this, Elijah came forward and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. 
Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Suddenly, the fire of the Lord fell from heaven and consumed the altar, including the stones and the dust, and lit up all the water contained in the trench. And when the people saw this, they all fell to their faces and said, The Lord, He is God! The Lord, He is God! Then Elijah said to the people, Seize the prophets of Baal, and let not one of them escape. And the people seized them, and they brought the prophets down to the Kishon brook, and Elijah slaughtered them there as Ahab looked on in stunned silence. After Elijah struck down the prophets of Baal, he approached Ahab and urged the king to return to the palace because a deluge of rain was about to fall from the sky following God's demonstration of fire from heaven which consumed the drenched altar, thus defeating the prophets of Baal. After three years of drought in Israel, the skies opened for a torrential downpour as Ahab sped away in his chariot toward Jezreel. Elijah, still filled with the Spirit, girded himself and ran like the wind to Jezreel ahead of Ahab's chariot. When Jezebel heard the full account of what happened at Mount Carmel from Ahab, she was livid and swore equal vengeance against Elijah in the same way her prophets were assassinated. The queen placed a bounty on Elijah's head, which prompted the prophet to run for his life to the wilderness of Mount Horeb and away from the vengeful Jezebel. While Jezebel's assassins pursued the fleeing prophet, God strengthened Elijah's resolve in the wilderness and instructed him to go to Aram, that is, Syria, to anoint Hazael king. Moreover, God set into place his purpose concerning the ultimate outcome of Ahab and Jezebel's rule over Israel. Elijah was instructed by God to anoint Jehu to be king of Israel. He also sent Elijah forth to lay the mantle on the shoulders of his successor, Elisha. God's intent was that these leaders would help turn Israel away from wicked idol worship and would be the facilitators of the destruction of the evil line of Ahab and Jezebel. Elijah was God's instrument for dealing the death blow to Baal worship in Israel, and the three men he anointed would remove the remaining vestiges of that particular form of idolatry. Selective obedience to God is still disobedience. God, by his prophets, communicated many times that there would be consequences when covenant promises are broken. The King of Israel, as leader of God's chosen people, is responsible for obedience to all God's commands. When God sends a prophet to advise the king on matters to preserve the kingdom, it would be wise to adhere to all that the prophet, as an emissary of the Lord, has to say. However, double-minded King Ahab listened selectively. The lesson at Mount Carmel concerning the greatness of God was easily forgotten. Yet God is still a God of mercy. Ben-Hadad was the king of Aram and ruled in Damascus. This king and his fathers before him allied with the nations around them in times of war. During the reign of Ahab, Ben-Hadad allied his kingdom with Judah, but not with Israel. Ben-Hadad 
and 32 kings of other provinces went to war with Israel twice in order to lay siege to Samaria. Ben-Hadad made a terrible mistake, however, when he minimized the power of the God of Israel. Observing his great horde against Ahab's army and believing that victory would be his, he boasted, The Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valley. God sent his prophet to Ahab and commanded him to kill Ben-Hadad because a victory would come to Israel that day. Ahab did not do all that God commanded and spared Ben-Hadad's life. Furthermore, he entered into a covenant with the king of Aram and let him go. God sent Ahab another prophet who said, Thus says the Lord, Because you have let go out of your hand the man whom I have devoted to destruction, therefore your life shall be for his life, and your people for his people. The lot was cast for Ahab, who returned to his palace in Samaria to sulk over the words of the prophet. Let's take a moment for this short break. When we return, we will continue with part one of A Tale of Two Queens and our story of Jezebel. Are you a devil or are you a saint? In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul exhorted the Corinthian believers when he said, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Self-examination is a necessary but difficult work. By a serious scrutiny of our hearts, we come to know to what prince we belong, whether to the prince of peace or to the prince of darkness. Many have foolish, presumptuous hopes. When strict scrutiny isn't based on God's word, they celebrate their state to be good, and while they weigh themselves in the balance of presumption, they pass the test. Many take their salvation for granted. The foolish virgins thought they had oil in their lamps, when in fact their lamps were almost empty. How confident are some of their salvation, yet they never examine their title to heaven. Many rest in good opinions of others. One may be gold and pearl in the eyes of others, yet a reprobate in the eyes of God. Others may think him a saint, and God may write him down in his black book. Judas was looked upon by the rest of the apostles as a true believer, yet he was a traitor. Then Jesus replied in John 6 verse 70, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? Others can but see the outward behavior, but they cannot tell what evil is in the heart. Fair streams may run on top of a river, but vermin may lay at the bottom. Are you a devil or are you a saint, beloved? Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, unless of course you fail the test. This is Lane Wilder for Carry the Light Ministries, bringing you insights from an elder. Welcome back. We will now continue with part one of A Tale of Two Queens and the conclusion of our story of Jezebel. During the Exodus, the people waited for the return of Moses in their camps at the base of Mount Sinai. When they looked up, they saw the fire in the billowing smoky cloud atop the mountain, and they could see the lightning and hear the rolling thunder. Meanwhile, Moses held his face to the ground as the voice of God resonated with the command. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or anything that is your neighbor's. Centuries before the time of Ahab in Israel, God spoke with the prophet Samuel concerning the people's demand for a king to rule over them like the nations around Canaan. God warned Samuel that a king would impose great burdens on the people and take from them what does not belong to him. Yet, the people refused to listen to Samuel and insisted on appointing a king to rule over them instead of the Lord their God. Thus, God had Samuel anoint Saul to be the first king of Israel. Unlike God, a king is subject to his own vices. King Ahab desired a vegetable garden near the palace in Jezreel and looked about to find the best place to plant. He looked through his palace window and saw an ideal plot of land adjacent to the palace with fertile ground suitable for growing vegetables. However, the land, which was a small vineyard, belonged to a man named Nabah of the tribe of Issachar and a citizen of Jezreel. In 1 Kings 21, the Bible details what Ahab said to this man Naboth. Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house, and I will give you a better vineyard for it. Or, if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth, remembering the word of the Lord concerning the law of inheritance, refused the king's offer. Although Ahab thought that he was giving Naboth a better offer than the actual value of the property, nevertheless, the vineyard Naboth owned was allotted to his family by Joshua and was not his to sell, according to Levitical law. In Leviticus 25, verse 23, Moses said to the people, The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. In Numbers 36, verses 7 and 9, Moses said to the people, The inheritance of the people of Israel shall not be transferred from one tribe to another. For every one of the people of Israel shall hold on to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. So no inheritance shall be transferred from one tribe to another. For each of the tribes of the people of Israel shall hold on to its own inheritance. As was his custom when he didn't get his way, Ahab returned to his palace in Jezreel and sulked and refused to eat any food. He was not in the habit of being refused whatever he wanted. His inner monologue argued as to why Naboth would refuse him. The offer he made was much better than what the man owned. It was more convenient for him, the king, to have his vegetable garden close to his palace for the days when he wanted to stroll through it and pick the occasional plant. What's wrong with that? It would please the king greatly. He sighed loudly as Jezebel entered the room and saw her despondent husband lying on his couch. The queen asked him why he turned away his meal and why he looked so sad. In response, he detailed all that occurred with Naboth the Jezreelite and the man's refusal to accept the king's offer. Jezebel taunted him. 
Do you now govern Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. True to the wickedness of her character, Jezebel devised a scheme with the king's full knowledge and his signet ring to destroy Naboth for refusing the king's request for the vineyard. Enjoying her power, the evil queen composed letters addressed to the elders and leaders in the king's name and used his seal of authority to proclaim a fast with Naboth as the head of the people. She arranged to have two scoundrels sit across from Naboth in the presence of the people, the elders, and the leaders. The two men brought false charges against Naboth of cursing God and the king, which held a sentence of stoning for the offense. Upon hearing this accusation, the leaders and the elders accepted their charges against Naboth, and the innocent Jezreelite was taken outside the city and stoned to death. The elders did not investigate the claims, but took the word of the two scoundrels who were paid by Jezebel. 2 Kings 9.26 indicates that Jezebel arranged to have Naboth's sons killed as well, to ensure that the inheritance would come to Ahab, there being no other next of kin, the king could lay claim to the property. When the queen heard that the deed was done, she went to Ahab, who was still sulking on his couch, and said to the king, Arise! Take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. Suddenly Ahab recovered from his morose mood and went down to the vineyard of Naboth to claim it as his own property as Jezebel watched him from the window, satisfied by the power she wielded to give the king what he wanted. In Job 34, verses 21 and 22, it says, For God watches how people live. He sees everything they do. No darkness is thick enough to hide the wicked from his eyes. The Lord knows the condition of the heart and sees the wickedness of our ways. As Ahab walked through the vineyard, plotting out his vegetable garden, he heard footsteps approaching from behind, and there stood the prophet Elijah from out of nowhere. The prophet was told where he would find Ahab, and he was sent to deliver a message from God to the king. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. For the anger to which you have provoked me, and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel the Lord also said, The dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city the dog shall eat, and any one of his who dies in the open country the birds of the heavens shall eat. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel his wife incited.
The Scottish poet Robert Burns wrote, The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. This sentiment also applies to wicked schemes that are revealed by God. When Ahab heard God's pronouncement in the voice of Elijah, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and humbled himself before God. His despondency before Naboth's death was nothing compared to the repentance Ahab felt upon hearing God's judgment against him, his queen, and his progeny. His sin was exposed. He coveted a man's property, had him and his sons murdered, and stole his property. God's judgment of Ahab and Jezebel as delivered by Elijah was righteous. Because of the king's repentance, however, God chose not to bring the promised disaster on Ahab during his lifetime, but during his son's days instead. Proverbs 6 verses 6 through 17 say, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Ahab and Jezebel were stained with the innocent blood of Naboth and his sons. Yet God showed mercy to Ahab in response to his humbled heart. Three years following this event, King Ahab allied with King Jehoshaphat of Judah to go up against Ben-Hadad of Aram, who, according to his covenant with Ahab, years before in exchange for his life and peace as allies, was to return back Israel, the ancestral territory of Ramoth-Gilead. Yet Aram did not keep his word as promised. This land was taken during the time of his father, King Amri. Therefore, it was important to Ahab to have it returned to Israel to strengthen his dynasty. This is indeed an interesting coincidence given what Ahab did to Naboth by taking his ancestral land given during the time following the conquest of Canaan. Once again, seeking prophetic advice from his diviners, Ahab gathered 400 prophets to tell him what he wanted to hear to justify his attack on Aram, and also to quell the concerns of the king of Judah, who questioned the wisdom of such action. The prophet Micaiah was the only dissenting voice, and to Ahab's displeasure, prophesied that Ahab would meet his death in battle for not heeding the warning to go against Aram. Once again, the wicked Ahab did not listen to the messenger from God and met his death on the battlefield as foretold by Elijah. The dogs licked at the blood pouring from the chariot that carried the dead body of the king. Ahab's sons Ahaziah and Jehoram both ascended to the throne in Israel respectively. However, both men were short-lived as rulers of the northern kingdom. The dowager queen and priestess, Jezebel, influenced the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth with her sons, even after Ahab's death in 853 BCE. She remained the strongest dark force behind the thrones of three kings over Israel while she was alive. The taint of this wicked queen was not limited to the northern kingdom alone. In fact, Queen Athaliah 
daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, and wife of Jehoram, king of Judah, followed after her mother's idolatry and wickedness in the southern kingdom. After the death of her son Ahaziah, and to claim the throne for herself, she ordered the slaughter of members of the royal house of Judah nearly to the extinction of the Davidic line, except for Joash, who was hidden away by Ahaziah's half-sister Jehoshaphat. The two remained hidden in the temple for six years during the reign of the idolatrous usurper. Ahab's son, King Ahaziah, died a year after his father, and his brother, King Jehoram, nine years after his brother, at the hand of Jehu, the general whom Elijah prophesied would end the Omri dynasty. The man God sent Elijah to anoint to be king of Israel. The prophetic message Ahab heard concerning the end of his line was the exact place his remaining son, King Jehoram, died, the very field where Naboth's blood was spilled. Jezebel outlived all three kings of the northern kingdom of Israel, the remaining men of the Omride dynasty. When Jezebel heard of the death of her last son and that General Jehu was approaching the palace at Jezreel, she knew he was coming to take her life. Never one to let the moment of drama go without notice, the wicked queen adorned herself in the best silks and jewelry and applied her cosmetics for the greatest effect. Hearing Jehu's army approaching from the windows overlooking the former vineyard that once belonged to Naboth, the queen went to sit at the window to call out mocking comments to Jehu as he passed. When he saw Jezebel hanging from the window in her finery, Jehu urged her eunuchs to toss the wicked woman from the high window. The eunuchs did as Jehu ordered and pushed Jezebel from the window down in the path of the approaching horses. The queen was immediately trampled underfoot by Jehu's horses as he casually went inside the palace to rest from his journey. Hours later, following his meal, Jehu sent some servants to collect the body of Jezebel from the field alongside the palace wall. But the servants returned and reported that wild dogs ate the broken body of Jezebel, and all that was left of the fallen queen was her skull, feet, and the palms of her hands. This was the fitting end of the notorious Jezebel. Before we end this episode about Jezebel, there must be mention of the legacy her notorious name has made through the centuries. The expression, Jezebel's spirit, has been used to refer to someone who is obsessed with domineering and controlling others. That historically wicked queen refused to repent and submit to the living God, whose victory at Mount Carmel was evident. She doubled down on her relentless campaign to eliminate Yahweh worship in Israel. She taunted and domineered her husband Ahab, who surrendered to her whims and wicked schemes and was ultimately held responsible for the spilling of innocent blood. Today, having a Jezebel spirit is synonymous with sexual immorality and forms of idolatry in order to manipulate the hearts and minds of others. It is a divisive and destructive spirit. It is wickedness personified, much to the folly of the one who becomes entangled with such a singular person. 
Thank you so much for joining me for this installment of Heroes of the Old Testament Stories from In the Lighthouse. I hope you enjoyed part one of Jezebel from our saga, A Tale of Two Queens. Next week, we will continue with part two of our tale with Esther. The contrast between these two women is very clear. So please leave yourself a reminder, or better still, why don't you click like and hit that notification bell to let you know as soon as the next video is uploaded. If you liked what you heard, share this video or leave a comment below. Also, please feel free to email us at thelighthouse at carrythelightministries.com. Transcripts for this and all future episodes can be found in our show notes. We welcome you to visit us at The Lighthouse on the web at www.carrythelightministries.com. And of course, follow us on social media. I'm your lighthouse keeper, Daphne Collins, with Carry the Light Ministries, bringing you this special edition. Until next time, be blessed.